Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us on this wonderful uh, webinar today. So let's just talk a little bit about cybersecurity. So I love this quote that it takes 20 years to build a reputation for a company and just a few minutes of a cyber incident to ruin it. And I'm sure you've seen some headlines over the past few years for these big companies that have experienced this, that they've been in business for a long time, pretty reputable organizations, and then all of a sudden they you know, have a breach and that's all anyone can think about. So this is, you know, obviously becoming more and more of a challenge for both big businesses as well as small businesses as well. And obviously I think that's why you're here today for this webinar. So before we dig into the actual elements of cybersecurity and threat, let's talk about what it is exactly. So the actual term, it's a bit of a buzzword, but it actually existed since 1994, but we really only started hearing in the mainstream in 2010. It's actually not really widely agreed to in terms of a definition. Some people actually still use the term information security. Some people think of cybersecurity as a subset of information security. Some people think that they're one and the same. Some people just think cybersecurity is a new word for computer security or network security. Anywho, for the purpose of this webinar, I want to define it as the practice of ensuring the integrity, confidentiality, and availability of your business information. And also on a more technical perspective, the ability to defend and recover against accidents or incidents. And this could be anything from hard drive failures to power outages and from attacks from adversaries. So let's dig into why we want to do that. So why does cybersecurity really matter? Well, I think really it comes down to the money. So let's look at some of the figures from our recent uh, Cybercrime 2017 report. Cybercrime damage is going to cost about $6 trillion annually by 2021. To deal with all this cyber damage, cybersecurity spending is going to exceed $1 trillion between 2017 and 2021. The human attack surface is going to reach 6 billion people by 2022. What that means is the amount of people actually on the internet. So actually right now, as of 2017, there were 3.8 billion internet users, which is about 50% of the world's population. So they're forecasting that that's going to jump up to, like I said, 6 billion. And by uh, 2030, they're suspecting it's going to be 7.5 billion internet users. And that the big one we are hearing around today of ransomware, that that's actually going to continue to rise and that the cost for ransomware will cost 11.5 no, 11 billion in 2019. And that Victor, oh, I found this is a great stat and kind of scary from a business perspective, that businesses will continue to fall victim to ransomware at a rate of four, as an attack every 14 seconds uh, by the year 2019. So that's pretty scary in terms of, and I put that out there because A, obviously money makes a difference, but it's also in terms of uh, how prevalent this is going to be in the future. It's not going away. So what can we do to actually protect ourselves from this? Well, and that's what this webinar is all about. Most of it is education and awareness. So we're going to get started by just talking about at a high level what cybersecurity or threats are. So Every internet user, I think any user, whether they're young, old, or business, should understand this sort of basic concept, that there are different types of breaches and threats that exist out there. So the hackers, which are the bad guys, they're always looking for weaknesses and vulnerabilities. And basically, in terms of your computer, there are three different ways that they can uh, find these vulnerabilities. There's physical uh, vulnerabilities like the hardware. So either actually getting to your laptop or computer and putting in a USB drive or, uh, you know, getting in through your router, sort of physical hacking type of thing. There's software hacking, which is kind of finding holes in the software to try to trick your software into doing things it's not supposed to or trick your laptop into not recognizing software that's not supposed to be there. And then the biggest component that they like to exploit is the human component. So this is where they like to play up the fact of disguising stuff to make it look like something you trust, you believe in, and you know, and basically is to elicit a response, whether it's clicking on something and opening up some viral software or going to a website and, and giving away your information to people that you're not, you didn't think you're giving it away to. So there are lots of different cybersecurity threats. These are sort of the most common ones. We're going to talk about some of these today. 
So overall, sort of data loss and compromised data is a big issue. Ransomware, which I just talked a little bit about, and we're going to talk about a little bit more today. We're going to talk about this one's actually becoming a more and more of an issue. And I've seen some samples, and they're actually quite scary in terms of the accurate, well, the type of genuine, like the emails look so genuine that you, I would say as an employee, I would struggle to know whether or not this is actually coming from someone in my organization. And that's sort of basically impressions of executives and managers. So hackers are trying to trick people within a company to give away information. It's kind of scary. Social engineering attacks. So that's a bit of an umbrella and we'll talk a bit about what falls within that. Viruses and also physical incidents are also on the rise as well. So in order to protect you and your company for from cyber breaches, I would recommend basically three sort of areas that we're going to look at. The biggest one is awareness and education. Knowing what the threats are, what to look for is a big key into making sure that you don't become fall victim. Two is sort of, you know, the software and the hardware pieces. You know, are you making sure that your software is safe and secure? Is your hardware safe and secure? And then having the knowledge and expertise, understanding, you know, what, making sure that you're up to speed with the newest threats that are out there. And also, do you have people on your team or in your business to help you that are knowledgeable about this type of stuff in case you do have an issue, like a ransomware incident, or to help set up your business in a way to be better defended against these types of threats? So let's talk a little bit about before we jump into the awareness and education portion that, you know, cybersecurity really is everyone's responsibility in a company or in personal life. But th the problem when you have this is when security is everyone's responsibility, it quickly becomes no one's responsibility. And part of running an effective cybersecurity program in your company is making sure that people have an adequate amount of knowledge to do their job effectively, and also to serve as like the first line of defense. So this is why at least having a basic security awareness terminology, what to look for, is a great place to start. And that's what we're going to cover in today's webinar. So let's talk about some of these big threats that I mentioned earlier and what they're about and what to look for. So social engineering attack. This is sort of like an umbrella statement that covers any kind of attack that relies on human interaction and involves tricking people into breaking, you know, sort of their normal security procedures. So they're trying to exploit things of the human psyche and they find different ways to do that. So part of what falls under this umbrella are things like phishing, spoofing, pretexting, baiting, so we're going to talk a lot more in this webinar about phishing and spoofing, but I'm just going to give you a little bit of a definition for pretexting. So pretexting is a technique where, unlike phishing, which we're going to talk more about, is about sort of uh, exactly like phishing, like with fish, but with a ph, is when you try to get lure people in to click on something to divulge their information. Pretexting is like that, except it requires a lot deeper trust level. So here's an example is if a hacker discovers that a company deals with an insurance company, insurance claims for healthcare, if they find out who that healthcare company is, they know that, oh, okay, as part of this, they generally have to be compliant with certain regulations. So if they, if the hacker knows what these regulations are, they could set up an email that they would send out to employees, basically from the government saying that in order to comply with this regulation, they have to click on this company link and sign in and use their credentials. So that requires a lot from a hacker's perspective, a lot more work. They have to kind of go in and find out about the company, about the employees, about the email structure. But again, the the it takes them a little bit longer, but the stakes are also much higher. So that's a little bit about pretexting. We're not going to go so much into that. And baiting is also very similar to phishing. What's distinguishing about it is it usually has like a big, exactly bait, something, a big carrot to really lure people in. So either free, free music, a free movie download. And basically to get this free item, you have to surrender your login credentials. So that's, that's sort of a high level, but let's jump into phishing and spoofing because those are sort of the most common ones that you're going to see on a daily basis. So spoofing and phishing actually works usually together. Spoofing is the act of basically creating a pretend website or email that looks like it came from a legitimate source. So you'll see here as an example up on the screen is this one, it looks like Facebook, but when you look actually at the URL, you'll see this is not Facebook's URL. So this is a, and people do this with emails, websites, that kind of thing. And so this is a way to sort of steal, get your trust so that they can steal your information. And as I mentioned, spoofing usually works together with phishing. So this is the most common 
threat technique used by hackers because it's really easy for them to execute, requires pretty little effort, and they can hit many, many hundred thousands of people. And again, they might not trick those hundreds of thousands, but they might trick one or two. And and then they go from there. So phishing is the act of basically using fake emails, text messages, websites, like I just showed you with the spoofing element, to elicit a response. So this could be a combination of sending you an email to click on it to go to a website and log in so they could steal your login credentials. It could be clicking on an email, going to a place to put in your credit card information. That'd be scary. Also, even just putting in information, they send you an email saying, hey, we need your address or something because we need to confirm it. So things like that. There's just basically a way to get your information through trickery. So the way you avoid being a victim of phishing and spoofing is first and foremost is stop before you click. Before I even go to number one right here, my biggest thing is just be aware that it exists and before you click anything, stop and let's take a look at it. Um, and for first of it is learning to identify like, and that's part of why I'm saying stop because all I know we are bombarded with emails. We're getting hundreds of emails a day and it's really easy to sit there and scan, scan, scan and swipe and delete, delete, delete or click really quickly because we're going through them such as such a quick rate. But this is where it's really important, especially with I'd say anything that's asking you for your information, something that seems like a company you trust, like Amazon, PayPal, banking, anything, don't click on it until you do these checks, okay? So first and foremost, you're gonna take a look at it to see is the name and the email correct? Uh, you're also gonna check the link. And the way you do that is if you hover over the actual URL in the email address, you'll see the URL come up. And obviously if it's Amazon, it should have an www.amazon.com type address, not some other kind. Another thing you should look for as well, and I found this in tons of the ones that I've, emails that I've received, is poor spelling and grammar. Now, a lot of these thing and phishing schemes come from abroad and they don't, English is not their first language, so they'll usually take an email, an actual letter that they might have found and alter it a bit. Again, their grammar and spelling is not correct, but they don't care, they put it in there anyways. And I find that interesting because People need to keep in mind that big companies like Amazon, like PayPal, like all these big companies, they have people on staff that it's their jobs to write emails and letters and make sure that they're perfect and the grammar is perfect. There is no spelling errors. Not to say that they don't have mistakes occasionally, but for the most part, they will be perfect. So if you're getting some weird email that has like very obvious blatant spelling mistakes, from some big organization, definitely a flag that this is probably not a, a real email. Also something to look for is threatening wording. So, cause they, they definitely, they want to elicit a response from you. So you'll see emails like urgent action required, your account will be closed, your account's been compromised. Cause they, you know, really they want to, they want to play on the, on that anxiety to get you to respond and just react and click on it. And in this example that I have here, you know, you see refund, you're like, Ooh, I'm getting money. Great, so you just go in. Oh, all you have to do is provide a billing address, perfect. But then it's like, wait a minute, Amazon has my, if they're providing me a refund for something, they have my address already on file. Why would they be asking me for it? So that's something to keep in mind. Here's a few other examples. So at the top here, you see it looks, you know, the email itself looks like it's from PayPal, has the right branding, but you'll see up at the top, it's the actual, spelling is like weird. It's billing at PayPal with an uppercase. If you actually go to PayPal's email address, it's lowercase. Uh, another way to look at it, and again, you might not know that, but if you go on your own, another URL, like to your Internet Explorer and type in www.paypal.com, you'll see up top that it's not pay and then pal, up, uppercase, it's just PayPal, uh, lowercase. Another way you can look at it is by hovering. You'll see here, they actually provide the link to make you feel like it's PayPal. But when you actually hover over it, it is not going to PayPal at all. It's going to some completely other address, some sort of catalog. Here's another example. It looks like a LinkedIn email address or email, but you'll see up at the top, it's coming from some different kind of uh, person. And you'll also see here below that there's some weird coding embedded in the actual email that has nothing to, it's something in Australia actually, and it has nothing to do with LinkedIn. Some other ways to make sure that you're not a victim to phishing and spoofing. Like I mentioned before, just anything to do with banking, money, anything like that, don't click on it. And then, but the, I've also found sometimes people like, oh, okay, I don't know if this is right, but they'll click on the link and it looks like they're bank, but they're like, okay, I'll just like 
go into my banking account anyways. And it's like, don't use any of the links provided in any emails to get to your bank. Always have that actually in your, uh, type it into your actual uh, Internet Explorer, your uh, web browser yourself, because like that, you know, you know for a fact that you're not being directed because these these folks get are very sneaky in terms of making these websites look and feel and behave just like the sites that you're uh, used to going to. Another thing to keep in mind is making sure that you only enter sensitive data into secure websites. And the way you know that is by looking in the top of your browser, any of the browsers, sometimes in some of them it's at the bottom, some of it's at the top in the actual URL area. At the top here, you'll see a little lockbox and it'll say secure. And you'll see when it's not secure, this will be unlocked. So that's still something to keep in mind as well while you're surfing and going to websites. Before you type in any personal information, if this is not locked down, don't do it. And as I said before, when in doubt, if anything seems fishy, odd, bizarre, just don't click on it. Actually, I want to mention one recently I've started noticing is a lot of like recruiting type spam emails that I've been getting where people are saying, hey, you, your resume. And I'm like, okay, even though I, I've a I don't know, I have no idea how they got my information, but somehow they know that I'm actively looking for work. And so somehow they've kind of, again, gotten smart about it and turned it around and said, oh, we have this job opportunity for you. And I was like, wait a minute, I didn't apply there. And, and I checked the URL and it was going to some weird place in like, I think in Czech Republic or something. And so there was something, anyways, they're getting much smarter and much more intelligent. So if anything just seems odd or off, like I said, just don't click on it. Just, just either delete it or put it aside and, and go and do your investigation on your own without clicking on any of the links. Here's another one that's very common and it's been coming up a few, both in Canada and in the US. And it's this one scares me a lot because, you know, at work we're busy, you know, especially people in certain departments like payroll or, or HR, you know, they're bombarded with people asking for stuff. And I don't know, you know, if everyone would take the time or the moment to actually go, oh, and really check their emails to say, is this actually from so-and-so? So here's what's actually happening. These hackers are getting, again, they're doing their research. They're finding out who's in a company, who the, the and this is, you know, easily, you can go to a website, find out who the leader is, because most companies have a page with who their executives are. So once they find out who the executives are, they create these emails with photo, with the email address. It looks authentic. And basically, they send it internally within a company saying, hey, give me this report with this data, either, you know, tax statements of an employee or tax statements for all the employees, things like that. And it's scary stuff because, you know, an HR person, if it's coming from the CEO, would they really balk at it? No, they'd probably be like, okay. And then they would send it along. So this is something, and it's definitely coming along around tax season because they, again, the hackers know that these conversations, these emails are happening, so it wouldn't be odd per se to get this type of request. So with this one, I definitely recommend that to avoid this, A, making sure employees are aware that this is happening, that this does happen, that their emails that come in, photos, everything looks like who it should be. Another part is also, you know, probably implementing some sort of a request for a policy for confirming sensitive requests. So, you know, maybe with people who do with HR, financial, any sort of business reporting, maybe there's a sort of, I don't know, maybe there's a code word that you guys always use when you release certain information. Or maybe when people send in emails like this, if it's not common, you know, if it's, you know, for example, the CEO never emails you for information, all of a sudden you get an email from the CEO, I would maybe call his assistant and say, hi, just want to confirm again, not be, not being a pain. I just want to confirm from security perspective. But again, having something whether it's by word of mouth, calling the person, maybe there's a text verification, something to make sure. And another way is also maybe look at how you structure your email addresses, how what information you put about your company online. You know, I understand that you know people want to put their leaders and stuff, but I guess do you have to put all your employees out there? Do is there value in everybody knowing who all your employees are? Maybe, maybe not. And also considering your email addresses. Some people obviously they want to make their email addresses as easy as possible, like first name dot last name at your company dot com. You know, maybe you mix it up. Maybe it's the first two initials of, of the first few uh, letters of the person's first name and their last name. Something a little bit different. Again, you want to kind of mix it up to make it a bit harder for these hackers to get to you. Let's talk about ransomware. So ransomware, it's a type of malware that basically once you get it onto your computer, it restricts your files and displays the messages 
a message demanding payment. And unless you pay, you, the restriction will be removed. So they say. So there's basically two types of ransomware. There's a lock screen, which basically, you know, once it's in there, basically you get this thing on your screen that says, ah, you have ransomware and the stuff's in the background, but it basically locks down your screen and you can't access your computer in the background because of the ransomware. There's also an encryption version where basically it goes in the back end and encrypts your entire drive. And the only way then that you can take it, get to access it is by getting the encryption code from them and they want money for it. So both very, very scary events to go. Here's an example of one that you would get on your screen and here they're asking for $300 worth of Bitcoin. Interesting. So my biggest recommendation is, I know it's very scary when this stuff comes popping up on your screen is first and foremost is don't pay the ransom because really they're meant to scare you. They're meant to intimidate you, you know, and, and even there's a bit of a challenge is some people have experienced, they've submitted the payment and they haven't guaranteed that their system has been regained access. So there's not this definite, like you pay and then everything's back to normal. I would, you know, consider your computer has been infected. You know, do you have, again, this is having someone on staff or having a great IT person support people to help you either to try to repair it, to get your data retrieved. And also part of it as well as, you know, we've so many, many other reasons of why backing up your data is important. But I think this is another perfect example of why doing regular backups of your data is important. And I know for me, I ha I personally do this on a regular basis. I back up all my laptop information on a physical, external, removable hard drive because even though I do put stuff in the cloud, I do put stuff on other drives, I do find that having a physical hard backup is important for this very reason. Viruses. So viruses have been around for a long, long time. We've talked about them, but a lot of people don't know exactly what they are, or what they do. They're basically a type of a malicious computer program that's either sent as an email attachment or you're sent to a place and you end up downloading it without knowing it type of thing. And it infects your computer. Uh, and then it can also, depending on the type of virus, infect anybody in your contact list if it's one that distributes itself via email. And sometimes there's some viruses that actually just going to a website can automatically download the virus in the back end. You don't have to actually click on anything. Just going to the website itself starts the download in the back end. So these viruses, they really can do a range of damage. They can send spam. They can provide criminals with access to your computer, to your contact list. They can scan and look through your computer for information that it deems and might want like password, uh, financial information. It could hijack your web browser. It can disable your security settings. It can display unwanted ads. And another thing too, is sometimes when they're running, viruses can attach itself to, um, to different programs. And so when you end up working with different programs and other people are working, you could spread them to other people in terms of via the cloud. So, and that's the thing, the variation of viruses out there are huge, but thankfully there are lots and lots of antivirus programs out there. There are free ones, there are paid ones. I personally believe you you get what you pay for. So investing a little bit, again, this is your security of your, of your, of your data. So investing a little bit more and making sure that you have a decent antivirus. And then part of it too, is making sure that your antivirus is up to date. I can't imagine how many people I've talked to who they have it, but then it expires and they're like, eh, and I'm like, no, it's not, eh. you have to actually go and make sure it's, you pay and keep it up to date because that's what they're doing. And these companies spend their business is keeping up to all the hackers and all the variations of viruses that are, are, are going on out there. Now, just to, even though you do have, you know, antivirus, it can happen where you might get a virus. So there's some things you can kind of look for. I know I, even though I have an antivirus, I've had a few instances where I've noticed some of these things and then I've gone and I've done a little update of my antivirus and then I've run the antivirus again, the scan, even though it's supposed to be doing it automatically and it's found it after the, after the fact. So here's some things to sort of look for. Like if you notice your computer's taking longer to start up or it doesn't start up at all, that's a bit of an issue. If you start clicking on certain programs and it takes longer to launch, files and data like moving or disappearing from certain places finding that there's certain pro and this is what i found is i had a certain program that just kept crap it was fine and then all of a sudden it just started crashing all the time oh this is also i've experienced this where your home page is set 
to a different browser. So you, you know, you've set it to Google or you've set it to whatever you wanted your homepage to be. And all of a sudden you come back to your web browser and it's somewhere else. And you're like, wait a minute, that's definitely a sign that something's been tampered. Also noticing that you're just either web pages are slow to load, possibly if your screen looks, your display looks fuzzy uh, or just not, maybe it's a little bigger, the fonts are bigger or really small could be an issue. Uh, or also noticing that there might be programs, like I had one incident where I had a program that kept, and I couldn't turn it off. And I uninstalled it and wouldn't let me uninstall. And that's when I knew that something has gone terribly awry and that there was some sort of virus that was locking down the software and not letting me uninstall it. But anything that kind of fishy, kind of suspicious like that, definitely, you know, don't don't turn your eye and definitely sort of either run your virus program, run a different virus program. That kind of stuff will definitely help. So we talked about, so this is the educate, that was the education portion and understanding, you know, what the types of threats are and what and how you can sort of identify them. And now we're talking about hardware and software. So the first part was more about from the human aspect. This is the back end. Now, obviously, as a human, you have the, the control to make sure that you have the right antivirus and the right hardware equipment and stuff like that. But this is more the, the manual stuff in the back end. So there's so software threats. So we have malware, which I sort of mentioned that it goes into your software or it goes into your browser or it goes into your operating system. Basically, it goes wherever they want it to go and it alters stuff and it can steal information. It can constantly feed information to the hacker on a regular basis. Lots of scary stuff with malware, like I said, because of the uh, variation out there. Definitely important to have a good antivirus to prevent that. Trojan horses. Back in the early 2000s, there's a sort of big influx of Trojan horses. They seem to kind of disappear for a while, but they're definitely coming back with a vengeance, so it seems. And basically, they seem well, like they were the, it's like the history lesson of a Trojan horse. They seem like a legitimate piece of software. You think that you're installing something that you're supposed to be installing, but actually in the back end of this software, there is a bad piece of software. And so when it, it launches, very similar to malware, as you launch it, it basically populates in the back end and it can do a variety of things. It could lock down your computer, it can share information, it can it can do all the various same things that a malware could do. And then there's another classification of spyware. So similar to malware, but spyware is specifically it doesn't really want to alter things. It doesn't really want to like play around with, with your software. It really wants to just exist in the background and watch you and watch information. Uh, and it can either and, and send that watched information to whoever put it there in the first place. So again, it could watch your email, it can, it can watch your web browser, it can watch many different things and send this information to whoever is the source of the spyware. I found that a lot of this spyware comes from like free downloads, it's usually in the back end. And you know, sometimes you're actually consenting to it going in there, sometimes it's not. And I actually found a lot of spyware because of its very nature, it's spyware, it's supposed to be sneaky and, and exist in the back end, doesn't always come up with virus scans. So there are a lot of virusware software um, applications out there that you can, some are free, again, some are not, and you can do a scan and just check to make sure that you don't have any kind of spyware running in the back end. And then there's hardware threats. So I know most of like cybersecurity, a lot of the emphasis is on the web and on secure, on the software being secure and you know, all that kind of stuff. But there's also the hardware aspect of it. And, and people often forget about this, is that making sure, especially at home, it's less of an issue, but in a work environment or trans moving your equipment from different locations, you always have to kind of be aware of the actual hardware threats. So cyber criminals, you know, also work in physical spaces. Yes, you know, in their different parts of the world, just coding spyware and other stuff. But there are people that are out there trying to physically get into computers. So either it's physically stealing a laptop, phone, a tablet, going into an office place and putting in a USB stick to either remove or add content to a device, walking by in public places. You know, how many people I know when I go to Starbucks and I walk by people on their laptops, on their phones and stuff, and I'm standing in line and I'm like looking at their laptop and everything that they're doing. I can see what they're typing. I can see everything. So are people being aware that people might be snooping uh, and also being aware that people have the ability to hack into webcams, Wi-Fi routers and other accessories that they could use those to watch you and therefore physically watch you put in your password and that kind of stuff and get access to your equipment or to your devices. I want to talk a little bit as well about old systems. So this is a question that sort of came in before the webinar and as part of it, so the question was like, what do you think about 
running uh, either computers running old legacy systems or perhaps you have like an older computer because you have some old software that you know runs your production and it only runs on windows xp and it you know you don't want to upgrade it because it doesn't run on anything higher so you keep this one computer running windows xp well there's a bit of a risk with that so i'll give you a bit of a just as a little uh, story of warning so last year the uk national health service was basically shut down, completely shut down. Their whole health service was shut down by ransomware. And the problem was, was that the whole system, everybody was running Windows XP. And basically all the new patches for 2017 were not running. So they could not actually deal with the ransomware. So they, this was a big of an issue. Not, so it wasn't just impacting one computer, it impacted thousands of computers. So with very few exceptions, like having this emergency patched, it was really expensive. They basically had to create their own patch, code their own patch. Uh, and Microsoft was like, sorry, we don't really support XP anymore. Uh, so, so basically my, the moral of the story after hearing about the UK National Health Service was that having a computer that runs XP or any old software is basically like having a castle with like no moat, no walls, no guns, no arrows. You're basically like, just open the door and let everybody in. Because unfortunately the way things are nowadays with the way patches and systems are, they're just not supported and you're basically, oh, and now, and that's the issue too, is you can have this lab, you could have this computer running, but if it's connected to your network, you potentially could infect your entire network through this one particular weak point. So that's just something to keep in mind. So some other things to keep in mind to make sure that you prevent any hardware or software compromises is making sure, like I said, regularly back up all your all your data. And like I, my tip, definitely doing maybe a physical backup, like an external hard drive, making sure that all your hardware is dry, running with the most current drivers. Like I said, this people do this for a living. They spend time researching what the, the weaknesses are, what the hacks are, and they make sure that the drivers and the software and everything is all up to date and has no holes in it. Physically, like lock down your equipment. So, you know, I've Maybe you've heard of people who put tape over their webcams when they're not using them, or if your laptop is at the office, do you, you, know, you have like a lock on it to make sure that no one can actually walk away from it? Are you in the front office or in the receptionist area? Do you leave your phone out? Do you leave a tablet out? Could someone walk in? Also think about having your screen locked down after a minimum time of activity. I know it's a pain. I know for me, I have it set to a minute of inactivity and you know, you turn around for a minute and it locks down, you're like, ah, oh, I gotta type in my password again. But you know what? It, it really only takes a criminal a minute to get access something in your computer if you stepped away. So having that, taking that extra step of just typing in your password, not a big deal if it's gonna protect your information. Obvious one, ensuring your antivirus is active and up to date. Like I mentioned, running a spyware program is also help it, helpful. You know, working with IT to make sure that employees don't install stuff on their devices. So I've actually worked at some organizations where if a device was provided to me, either a laptop or a phone or tablet, it's actually locked down that no other software other than what they provide me can be installed on the device. And I think that's a great way, again, to just prevent potential of unwanted things being loaded on these devices. And then we didn't really talk too, too much about it, but there's a whole level of passwords and making sure that your employees use complex passwords. Because uh, a lot of the stuff we talked to today was just giving your password out, but there's a whole other conversation that to be had about security in terms of making sure that people can't guess your password. Like I, I think, I think every year they do a sort of study and about people commonly use passwords and, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like continues. I know I think now most passwords require eight digits. So the amount, the fact that people continue to use one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight as a password is amazing to me. So again, having that conversation with employees or actually setting up requirements when they set up their passwords, that there are digits, that there are uppercase, lowercase, and a mixture of symbols sort of forces them to make their passwords a little bit more complex. And finally, let's talk a little bit about knowledge and expertise. So keeping yourself up to date on what's going on in the cybersecurity world is a good way to start because again, there's always new sort of hacks and areas of concern sort of happening. So, you know, you could put yourself on one of these feeds just to get a regular update weekly update. There's some common ones that I put here, Hackers News, another one recommend dark reading. 
securityintelligence.com and um, krebersonsecurity.com. It's a fellow smart guy, but he's also always talking about sort of different security threats. Subscribe to one of those and just sort of keep up to speed with what's going on in the cybersecurity world. And also consider leveraging like some expertise from a company. So I don't know within your organization, whether you have anyone who's an expert in cybersecurity, but consider going to a company and asking them to evaluate your current security measures. And they could, you know, a lot of them will go through what you currently do, both your software, your hardware, even your human aspect, your procedures, and they can talk to you about recommendations on how to make your business more and data more secure. And they can also help you with ongoing maintenance of your, all of this, your antivirus and all these different devices and stuff to make sure that everything is safe and secure. Great. Well, I really hope that you guys found this webinar helpful and I hope you'll join us for our next one. Music